Good morning. I think we're ready to go. We've gotten the go-ahead. Welcome to our morning educational session. I'm going to be introducing some uh, folks from the Kentucky Court of Justice. My name is Brian Green, and I am the uh, Vice President of Operations with Justice AV Solutions out of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we're known as JAVS or JAVS. We have been working with the Kentucky Court of Justice since about 1984, well, something we'll get into here in a little bit. Our presentation is using or meeting people where they are by using technology, and we're going to go over how the, the Kentucky Court of Justice has been using JAV systems to be able to meet the needs of their matters for uh, remote hearings or virtual hearings and then simultaneous interpretation. Our presenters are going to be uh, Lucas and Josh Elliott. Uh, Beth is the Implementation and Court Services Director, and Joshua Elliott is the uh, Executive Officer of the uh, Office of Language Access. Uh, we're going to discuss a few different things. We're going to be discussing the challenges with remote court, uh, whether they're technical or the personalities that are involved there. Uh, we're going to be discussing a program that Kentucky's put forward uh, called the Judicial Support Specialist Program, or the JSS. And uh, we're then going to be going into the benefits of being able to use remote or virtual court. What does that do uh, for Kentucky, uh, for the constituents there? Um, and then we're finally going to get into what's considered the remote simultaneous interpretation, or RSI, aspects of how they're using the JAV system, and then bringing those uh, interpretive sessions to those people that need them in the courts uh, using technology. Uh, finally, we'll have some future considerations that are there, and uh, time permitting, uh, we can answer any questions that you guys may have when we get to that point. First, we'd like to talk about a little bit of the, the tech history with the Kentucky courts. In 1982, there was a Judge James Chenault that uh, was in Madison County, and he approached JAVS at the time and needed a system uh, that worked better than what he was using to make a court record. And that's where JAVS really came to be born, was working with the Kentucky courts back in the early 80s to bring a JAVS system into place that created an unmanned solution. In 1989, the state of Kentucky decided that they were going to make video the official record of the courts. So there's no transcripts in Kentucky. Attorneys write briefs and they cite minutes and seconds in these recordings. Uh, in 1989, it was VHS cassettes that they were referring to. Uh, now it's all digital, of course, so it's on uh, CDs, DVDs, and sometimes it's just some online media. So it, it, it's grown over the years, but they are using that video as the record of the courts, not using any transcripts in place there. Um, to know a little bit about the Commonwealth of Kentucky, it's made up of 120 counties. Um, in each of these counties, there's at least three JAV systems, depending on the population. Uh, for your circuit, district, and family courts, the larger uh, counties, of course, have more systems in them. And there's seven appellate districts, 57 circuits, and 59 districts. There are a few judges that will go to multiple different counties, hold court there. They kind of travel and, and, and have their matters in those counties, uh, again, to meet people where they're at. Uh, but there is a clerk uh, in every county that is there, too, that is you know, responsible for the records there. So now that we've kind of got the table settings or the table set there, we're going to move on to the actual presenters. Uh, and I'd like to introduce to you Elizabeth Lucas, and she's going to take it from here and tell you about the challenges that they've had with Zoom and uh, getting those things going. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Good morning. So fun fact, um, my nickname is Aunt B. So all my nieces and nephews call me Aunt B. So if you leave nothing with nothing today, you can remember that fun fact, okay? And I appreciate those of you who laugh. Thank you very much. Um, it's actually more funny when I was roaming through different stores with my nieces and nephews this high and they were screaming, Aunt B, Aunt B, and everybody would turn around like, who in the world is that? All right, well, we are going to start this morning with some of the challenges with remote court. Um, I think that in the early days, we called it the wild, wild west. Did any of you, show of hands, go through that similar um, experience? All right, let's do this instead. How many of you are judges? Raise your hand. How many of you are court administrators? Raise your hand. How many of you are court clerks, clerks of court? How many of you are IT people? Raise your hand. All right, who does that leave? Anybody? People, okay, all right, so 
In the first days, it was pretty much, how do we get up and running, right? It was everybody's challenge. In a unified court system, it's even more challenging because unified does not necessarily mean uniform. And by that, I mean we have historic courthouses, we have brand new builds, we have judges who have been on the bench for years, we have brand new judges, we have clerks that have been in office for years, we have brand new clerks. So how do you get all those people on the same page and using what was then termed remote court? right? Which means everybody, all the participants are remote. Sometimes that meant even the judge was remote. Um, the rules of engagement were developed on the fly. We'd seen nothing like this prior and probably will never see nothing like this again because now we have a, a somewhat of a sense of preparedness. Um, I think you'll hear me refer to remote court um, today, but also we are also talking about hybrid court. And that came about a year later, right, when our remote participants, some of them returned to in-person, particularly our attorneys, um, but some of our participants remained remote. So that's our hybrid court experience. And I've also heard the term virtual, so we'll use all of those interchangeably today. The first thing I think we all saw with remote court were some of our decorum failures. Um, and I'm sure you all have, all have had your experiences and can share some of those. I see some of you nodding your head, so I know you saw them. Um, but we have actually a panel of judges who are gonna share, and, and judicial support specialists, who are gonna share their experience. Technology has influenced or, and impacted courtroom uh, decorum in uh, several ways. They were calling in from their bed, hopefully with their shirt on, hopefully not with a cigarette in their mouth driving in their vehicle, shirtless. Had people who won't sit down, they walk like they're walking a marathon the whole entire time that you're on the video. And we've had a couple of people that haven't realized their cameras are on and they are in the restroom. People showing up as cats or anything else. We had a lot of instances with people in bed or without clothes on or smoking or ingesting other substances. We have had people that um, are sleeping and when you log on, it kind of startles them. There was one, and you may want to delete this, a couple were even. You can fill in the blank there with whatever you wish. How many of you saw the I Am Not A Cat video that came out and went viral? Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Where the attorney, I guess someone had used his computer, had turned on the cat filter, and then basically said, I am not a cat, I'm prepared to proceed, which if you could watch, if you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. But did any of you have any of these experiences when you began remote court? Yes, indeed, right? So one of the things that we started early on with was what can we do to help? How do we help meet people where they are? Um, we looked at developing a remote court proceedings uh, program whereby we had facilitators at the administrative office of the courts who could facilitate the courtroom events for the judge. So that was kind of our first take at how can we help. Um, we developed some remote court procedures, uh, standard operating procedures, documentation, how to get started, kind of all those things. Um, and then of course as we moved into the year, more technology came out. And as you know, as soon as the new technology comes out, it's outdated and there's more new technology right behind it, right? So being able to move quickly and be flexible in how you implemented a program was really important. We started with Teams. How many of you are Microsoft Office shops? Okay, so did you use Teams as for remote court initially? No, some of you did, some of you didn't. How many of you use Zoom right out of the gate? How many of you wish you owned stock and Zoom when this happens? Exactly, okay? Um, and I'm sure they were quite happy with the fact that all of us then became heavily dependent on Zoom as our platform of choice. Then soon after that, help was on the way, and the concept of a judicial support specialist program kind of took form. We have a support of our leadership, of the Supreme Court in Kentucky, and they actually formed our, what we are calling the Judicial Support Specialist Program. Basically what this meant was judges support staff were eligible to be, um, to apply and then be accepted into a training program to actually help with remote court proceedings and other kind of technology things that are coming up with the court. 
we liked the opportunity here because we could build change agents, which as you know is incredibly important in a court environment to have people who can lead change. So these judicial support specialists would help us build this camaraderie with the judges as well as facilitate remote court. The other thing that's really important in Kentucky is we wanna build sustainability. We want a program that lasts out the people, right? So you want a program that is sustainable down the road, regardless of who are in those positions. And I don't know about you all, but do you have turnover in your courts at all? Just a little bit? Right. So it's important to have kind of that program in place, and then you can rebuild your staff as you need to. So some of the things we started with was an application process. The judge had to apply to have his or her JSS in the program. Once accepted by our Human Resources Department, they had to participate in a certification course. This was a six-hour course, um, three hours online, uh, two hours with one of our facilitators actually observing or shadowing that person, and then a one-hour observation course where our facilitator would observe them actually uh, doing remote court in their jurisdiction. So that was our program. Um, in, in the online course, we talked about remote court, we talked about the tools, we talked a lot about e-filing and judges um, submitting orders electronically, and also analytics, so the data that then resulted from all of that activity. So we rely heavily on our JSSs for those activities. Also, it's not a one-and-done approach. So you put a program like that in place, which is great, but then you have to have refresher training or annual certification, recertification, and that's what we have now. So as of June 30th, uh, we have 147 judicial support specialists who have been recertified for the next year. And we supplement those folks with um, our remote court facilitators as well through the administrative office of the courts. So how has that worked? Let's, let's hear about it. The JSS program has been an absolute godsend. Um, basically, I set up the breakout rooms, admit and rename participants as they enter the Zoom meeting so that the judge can easily identify the parties for each case and then assign each party to the appropriate breakout room. Additionally, as individuals enter the Zoom meeting, I remind them prior to moving them into a breakout room that even though they're appearing remotely, that the same decor must be followed as if they're in uh, person. The JSS program from a certification perspective has helped a lot because it's now a, a consistent message to those. Again, for new employees or for the first time they go through that training, it's been both of them have reported a wonderful experience through that program and allowing them to uh, be introduced to new technology that they were unfamiliar with or learn aspects of the program that they didn't even know exist to also offer even nerds like myself uh, 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 new options potentially how to handle those individuals or to deal with individuals online. So it's been wonderful for new employees. The hybrid court has benefited from training and certification programs for JSS for several things, they um, have allowed us to use different aspects of Zoom. We're able to do breakout rooms. We're able to keep cases confidential by allowing only certain people in the Zoom meeting. The hybrid court has benefited in that the training and certification program ensures that all districts and circuits have well-trained staff to help facilitate the hybrid court process. While all judges may not you know, follow the same process or methodologies when they're holding court. Um, having a certification program that requires training ensures that judges are kept informed of any upcoming changes and or resources that may be available to enhance the experience for participants and adjust accordingly. So when you talk about the benefits of remote court, we have the top four here. How many of you think accessibility is the number one benefit of remote court? Raise your hand. What about efficiency? Raise your hand. What about flexibility? Okay, and what about safety? I like, where are you from, ma'am? Where are you from? Uh, she's here in Florida, and she raised her hand every single time. Thank you so much. All right. So it, it, everybody's experience is a little bit different. And from the court side, I think we can agree that all of these really helped um, in terms of remote court and the benefits thereof. But let's hear what our judges have to say about it. 
greatest benefit to technology in the courtroom, hands down, is the expeditious manner for which we can deal with a case now uh, and, again, avoid the excessive continuances. The greatest benefit of technology in our courtroom is the efficiency and uh, the security. Some days I've joked that um, we're almost as efficient as the Chick-fil-A drive through where, you know, it's everyone comes in and we immediately get them taken care of. That's just on certain dockets when it happens to be a light docket, but it has improved our efficiency where people aren't having to wait as long. Um, I think we are having better attendance and we're able to get things resolved wherever people are. When the pandemic was going on and we were shut down, we found people in other prisons in other states that had missed court and made arrangements and got those people an attorney and got them on Zoom and resolved cases. And so just the mere fact that it exists gives us an efficiency and an ability to do things with people that may not be here, but to get their stuff resolved. And I think it's just a super efficiency um, benefit. We get so much more participation. I would say that our participation has increased probably at least 40%. But, and the other thing that it has done, and this is what we've heard from our domestic violence victims, is that it really takes uh, away a lot of the anxiety they have from coming to present their cases, knowing that they have the option to present over the platform. As far as participation of litigants, um, I have a lot more participation from litigants on my dependency, neglect, and abuse dockets than I ever had pre-COVID. You know, we ask people that we've removed their kids from them. We ask them, you know, to have a job, to have a home, to have stability. But then we tell them, you have to come to court once a month. You have to go to your social worker's office. You have to make all your other court appearances for all your other cases. And what ends up happening? They get a job, they then lose it because they're gone all the time to court. And we have to start all over because when they lose their job, they lose their home, they lose their stability. So um, employers are much more apt to allow an employee to take their break and uh, join court from either the break room or their car um, because they're only going to be gone 30 minutes, not all, all day. So I think they basically said what we said, right, in terms of the accessibility and flexibility for all participants. I think that's a key to remote court. Does anybody think we'll ever go back to not having remote court? Anybody? I think it's here to stay, right? And how people use it and, and the way it's used may change over time, but I do think that it's here to stay. And I think the judges will concur and that there is a time and a place, right? So um, I particularly like what Judge Brown said about safety and the fact that you know, we can physically and emotionally support people's well-being. And I think that's an important part in court as well. Um, all right, so technology. So with, with the support of the programs behind it, you know, you also have to have technology. The technology is great, but if you don't have the support, the training, the understanding behind it, the technology is useless. And I think uh, Josh will speak to that in a little bit as well. But in Kentucky, uh, and this may be unique to Kentucky, we have different levels of technology that are all over the state. We have, like I said before, a unified court system, but you can't get to 120 counties in one day. So we have different levels of the application and the technology that are out there. Um, and we are moving from the second generation, what was what we called the laptop interface, right? We put a laptop in every courtroom, the judge could use that laptop for remote court versus his or her personal device. Um, so we still have about 230 of those, um, but we're moving toward um, what we'll call our HDX JAVS 8 system, which is the most technically current system, and we have about 69 installations. Now we have over 400 courtrooms, so that's not gonna to happen today, right? In fact, our rollout of our HDX system is scheduled to last till 2024. So as we get there, those other generations, well, guess what? Well, they'll fall off, but guess what? Something else is coming, right? So then we'll have the fifth generation and the sixth generation. I mean, you're talking now about evidence presentation. What does that look like? And how do we support that with the electronic record? So all of those things will constantly be changing. Let's hear about it.
So before um, the COVID emergency, um, we had no technology at our bench in our circuits. So during the pandemic, we started immediately trying to kind of put stuff together and our technology department um, gave us lots of support as did um, our JAVS contractors and we were able to get our laptops where we could be functional at our benches. We've probably had our Zoom room here in Marion County because we had a higher level of technology here with our JAV system to start with. We've probably had it for anywhere from nine to 12 months. Um, it has enabled us to not take our laptops with us anymore. And also we now have a Dell all-in-one system at our bench. And so we've gone from having no technology to having a great amount of technology available in the courtroom. And so it's just totally changed how we work and has been a great experience for us. And I think that's a key too, is, is you know, the technology is changing so quickly that we had judges with very limited technology and now they have five and six devices, right? So it can be kind of overwhelming on one hand, but you can see that some of the judges quickly adapt and, and take to the technology. This is kind of a visual depiction of the courtroom equipment, but it really doesn't tell you what it really looks like, but the next couple will. So I said earlier, we have a lot of historical court courthouses. This is what the technology will look like in the courtroom. Um, whether it's the cameras or the one touch device that Judge Anderson referred to, the tap device that brings people into that Zoom room with one touch. So these are just a couple of the pictures of the technology and what it looks like. In addition to the courtroom technology, we worked with our jails in Kentucky on video arraignment. Um, they received a grant to install some devices in in their jail facilities that then speak to the courtroom for video arraignment. So this has streamlined our process considerably. We are just at the very beginning of um, rolling this out with the jails. And so this is what that device looks like. And I think video arraignment was one of the first things that we, we did in Kentucky, but um, it's now being vastly improved. So let's hear what the judges and the jailer has to say about it. So the video technology has impacted our arraignment dockets in several ways. It's important to note here in Campbell County, we've always used some form of video technology to communicate. We at one point had a direct fiber link uh, to our fiber optic line into our jail. So we had before only two rooms, though we are limited to only two rooms and isolated to those two rooms. Now, because of the Zoom technology and the technology that's over at our jail, we can go to a lot more than two rooms. We can go to any room in our jail. In addition, we can go to any jail in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that will allow us to Zoom. And we've actually used it to contact other defendants in other uh, even states. So as close as Ohio and as far as upwards of like New York. The other thing is when I, the rare opportunity that I do have to have inmates uh, being a family court, you know, when we bring people over from the jail, they have to dress out, they have to bring them over. Um, we have to have an extra bailiff in the courthouse or the courtroom. And um, we don't have to do that with Zoom. With, with Zoom, uh, the jail logs in, uh, we have their hearings and um, we don't have to worry about the safety concerns and, and the extra expense of bringing them over and having the extra bailiff. And it allowed us to have arraignment and to have short hearings and to provide process for individuals without having to transfer them physically from one site to the other, which, you know, anytime you're transporting inmates for, for jailers and for sheriffs, that's probably the most dangerous thing we do. But it, but it also allows it to be more fluid and a more viable option for other courts to have jail or to have uh, video court hearings, jail, arraignment, whatever, that would otherwise take days or weeks to get people transported. So that tells you a little bit about the Judicial Support Specialist Program and the technology that we've used in Kentucky to help meet people where they are. But I think a bigger piece or as big of a piece is how do we meet people where they are with language differences. And so Josh Elliott, our Executive Officer from the language of, uh, Office of Language Access is gonna talk to us a little bit about that. Thank you, Aunt B. <laughs> we can set up here, ladies and gentlemen. 
So good morning, my name is Joshua Elliott. I'm the executive officer of what we call Kentucky's Office of Language Access. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to chat a little bit about something I'm so passionate about. Uh, I feel like a lot of times, you know, in the, the hustle and bustle that was produced when we, we moved from, you know, pre-pandemic, very little virtual into this virtual space, uh, we didn't really think a lot about how that affected language access. In a place here like Florida, it's, it's sort of on the forefront, right? We think about that a lot. In a place like Kentucky, maybe not so much. So it, it's such a privilege for me to be here and, uh, and discuss this with you and, and highlight what Kentucky's program has done. Uh, I feel that language access is well suited. It's a good fit for this discussion. The title of this presentation is Meeting People Where They Are. Right? And I feel like language access on many levels has always done that. We've always met people where they are, even before technology was a thing. Right? Our goal was always to provide access and meet them where they are, linguistically where they are, culturally where they are, and provide that, uh, that bridge. And so I feel like now, adding the technology piece to this, we're well suited to be a part of this discussion. So I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity. Let's move forward to our first slide here. Before we get into the, the nitty gritty, let me give you guys just a, an overview of Kentucky's language access program, throw out a few numbers. So our overall population in Kentucky is approximately 4.5 million. Um, you'll see that we have 180,000 LEPs, that means limited English proficiency, so people with limited English proficiency. And you may hear me refer to them just as LEPs along the way, that's what that means. So that represents about 5% of our total population, and that's really just um, the known LEPs that we've counted. I, I think it's likely quite a bit higher than that. Um, in terms of our internal program, we have 12 staff interpreters, and I include myself in that number. I'm also an interpreter as well. Uh, 10 of us are Spanish. Uh, we have one American Sign Language interpreter on staff, and we have one Bosnian interpreter on staff. And then we work with 125 contract interpreters, um, and that's just, uh, that's all languages. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our languages in a moment. In terms of our staff interpreters, I'm really proud of how we have our uh, program um, structured. So all of our interpreting positions, including my own, are hybrid positions. So we not only interpret, of course, in my heart of hearts, that's what I am, I'm an interpreter, uh, but we also each have special administrative functions. So in my case, I am the director of the program, you might say. Um, each of our staff interpreters does something. So they supervise a region, they're in charge of the business that we do in a certain area or a certain language. And so in that way, we really look to, uh, to provide efficiency to our courts that way. We provided 96 different languages in calendar year 2022. That was a record for us. And so you think about Kentucky. Kentucky is 37th um, in terms of all 50 states with regard to size. We're 26th by population but yet we're becoming very, very diverse. Um, each year we've seen an in increase in this number. As I mentioned, that was a, uh, certainly a record for us. Before last year, we were hovering around 80, 80 different languages. And so what happens is geopolitically, um, we have groups that move into the, uh, to the state based on what's happening uh, from an immigration perspective across the world. We have groups that sometimes move out of the state. Kentucky is a natural settlement ground um, utilized by many refugee organizations. And so when refugees come into the United States, one natural settlement point for them is Kentucky. So we have these language groups throughout our state in different locations um, that we obviously have to serve in our courts. It can make it very, um, very challenging from a language access perspective, but it's also fun. It keeps me young. It's good stuff, you know. So one of the things that I'll mention, and it will become important as we talk a little bit about the solution we've put into place to provide remote simultaneous interpreting, is the fact that because we are a unified system, as Beth mentioned, um, we have centralized interpreter scheduling. And even being a unified system, it's not a given that you would necessarily have this. So I'm, I'm proud that we were able to go this way. What this means is that we have 120 counties in Kentucky, all 120 counties, all courts in all 120 counties. And as Brian said, there are multiple levels of court in each county. They come through my office for language access services all language access services. So whether they need an interpreter or a document translated, uh, whether it's in court or outside of court, maybe at a clerk's window, my office handles all of the business. And so that allows us to get a nice panoramic overview of what's going on. And we have a really good idea of what our court's needs are. And we can meet those needs efficiently because we sort of see everything. Uh, now, the flip side of that is we see everything, right? There, there's a lot of volume. 
Um, it, there's a whole bunch of uh, work that goes into making sure we meet the needs of our court, but um, it certainly helps to have that panoramic overview. We made that change uh, in 2018. And before that time, each county was sort of requesting their own and hiring their own interpreters. Now everything comes to us, everything is centralized. And so those hybrid positions that I talked about before, they um, part of what they do are our staff interpreters, supervisors, they're out in the field managing these requests. And so talking about requests, last year, we had a total of 15,779 requests. That's for all languages, all counties. And I'll mention that when we talk about requests, keep in mind that one request may represent several people. Usually when we have Spanish requests, you know, we're talking about a docket, we go and there may be three people, there may be 10 people. And so really by saying, you know, 15,779 requests, um, we're talking about potentially tens of thousands of people that we've served. Uh, most of that is Spanish. So 76% uh, of our volume is in Spanish. And we've been trending on that now for a few years. It's sort of creeping up towards 77% this year, right? In fact, what I can tell you, a number that's not included on this slide, looking at the first six months of this year, um, up through the end of June. Uh, we are now at 9,000 requests total, all languages, which puts us on track to be over 18,000 by the end of the year. So it's just constantly growing. Um, some of it is that we have better ways to track numbers now. Some of it, again, is just we're getting more, more people, uh, more people that need our services. And so it's a massive amount of business we're doing for such a, a small amount of play, space, really. Um, our six most requested languages in 2023, and there can be some variance here depending on the year, uh, but this has been fairly steady over the past couple of years. So number one by far is Spanish. Number two is American Sign Language. Actually earlier this year, it was briefly overtaken by our number three now, which is Swahili. So remember geopolitical trends and people coming in. We've had a huge influx of Swahili speaking immigrants come into Kentucky recently. It's a, a real challenge for us to keep up with that volume. Uh, number four is Kinyarwanda, which is also very difficult to keep up with. Uh, number five is French and number six is Arabic. Uh, we'll see in a couple of years from now, some of these may fall off completely. We may be dealing with something very different. Uh, that's one of the things that I love about remote technology when it comes to language access, right? Because you think about the diversity you're seeing here. You think about Kentucky, you know, we're sort of landlocked and we're, you know, right here, sort of in the middle of the southeast part of the country. Although I have a very diverse population to serve, I don't have an extremely diverse population of interpreters <laughs> to, to work with. And so what do I do? I have to bring in people from outside. Before that meant literally putting them on a plane, flying them in, right? Maybe I could do telephone. With the technology that we'll talk about, I'm able to use the best interpreters from across the United States always. So if you need a Kinyarwanda interpreter, there are like three guys in the US that really do that well. I can get those three guys and I can put them in our courtroom. They know our judges, our judges know them by name. We can work with them directly. It's been a game changer for us, right? It, it's really fantastic. We can work with the best interpreters from anywhere in any language, even beyond the US if needed. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So just some, some quick information about the technological piece. So before the pandemic, right, it was essentially 100% in person. I mean, we would do a little, you know, telephonic. We would do video occasionally um, if we had a, a, a very specific need with a hard to find language, but it was almost all in person. You know, again, all Spanish and we do that pretty well internally. Uh, I should mention we do, of course, use Zoom for all virtual proceedings when language access is needed. It's got some nice functionality that allows us to do simultaneous interpretation. And I'll explain more about that in just a little while. So overnight, essentially, the pandemic, we went to 100% remote right? Like many of you guys did. Um, the problem was that, you know, we sort of had a good idea of what to do, right? We, we'd done it a couple of times, but on a statewide level, we really didn't have the infrastructure to just do remote, especially to do remote simultaneous interpretation. So let's talk a little bit about the differences between consecutive and simultaneous. Consecutive is sort of like a telephone, right? And so somebody calls me on the phone and I can listen, I can hear them speak, and I can be silent or they can hear me speak, I can speak to them and they can hear me, but I can't hear and speak at the same time. The phone system, it's just, it's just really one single channel, right? It's not designed to allow both of those things. And so what that means is that in court, if I open up Zoom and I have a regular Zoom meeting, for example, or maybe it's Microsoft Teams, if that's what you use, I can listen to a judge speak, I can listen to an attorney speak, or I can speak and they can hear me but I can't do both of those things at the same time. So you get into this, what we call consecutive interpretation. What is your name? Stop. My name is. Stop. Where were you that night? Stop. 
I was here, stop, and there's interpretation in between. That's consecutive. The issue is that it's longer when we do it consecutively. It takes twice as long because I'm waiting for the response. What judges want is simultaneous. When we're on site, we do simultaneous, right? I hear the judge and they're speaking and I'm speaking at the same time, I'm interpreting, that's called simultaneous. So it requires some special handling. We had infrastructure in place to do consecutive in most places, but how do we get to simultaneous? Um, that's, that's the issue. How can I hear and speak at the same time? What solution is gonna work? So it's finding something that's sustainable that makes a lot of sense. And Beth talked a little bit earlier about the evolution of what we've done in our courts, the technology. And so there were four different levels as long as we're at level two in our courtrooms, and most of our courtrooms are at least at level two, we call that laptop interface. What that means for us from an interpreting perspective is that it's integrated, right? So you have the audio integrated with, with Zoom and integrated with JAVS, right? So our audio system is completely integrated. And what that means is that it allows the interpreter, when they're interpreting off site, they can actually hear through every external microphone in the courtroom. They're getting that audio feed, it's coming through and they're getting that fed to them directly through Zoom. And so it's an excellent audio experience. And then I'm hearing it and there's a separate channel through Zoom Simultaneous, which is something uh, native to most Zoom accounts, right? So through Zoom Simultaneous, I'm hearing the audio feed through all of these different microphones in the courtroom. It's really an excellent experience. And then I'm able to interpret directly to the user, to the LEP simultaneously as we go. And then when that person needs to respond, I can very quickly toggle over to English and it comes out of the loudspeakers in the courtroom. You know, did you understand everything that I said, sir? I toggle over, yes, I did. And in English, you would hear that out loud, right? Um, this is sort of a bold statement, but as an interpreter, I can say this. When this works correctly, the way that we have it set up, uh, when everything is integrated, um, we're getting that, that feed from all of the, the external microphones, right? And it's coming directly to us. The audio experience for the interpreter, in terms of my ability to hear and therefore interpret accurately, because I'm hearing, you know, the audio is, is nice, um, it's actually a better experience than when in person most of the time. In person, you deal with acoustics of the courtroom. Like you have to move a lot of times. You have to figure out where the best vantage point is to actually hear. Usually when we do this and we do it well, um, the interpreting experience is actually generally better because you're getting a great audio feed. It's, it works very, very well, right? So currently I would say we're at 20 to 30% remote services. Um, what we're trying to do is keep what makes sense. and so. Obviously, we try to honor the preference of our requester. They want in person. You guys know this. Everybody wants in person. So we try to do that. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense, though. You know, I've got that one guy that speaks that language that's hard to find, right? And they're located in Oregon, and I'm in Kentucky, and it's going to cost me $10,000 for a 15-minute kind of thing. Ah, it doesn't make sense. So we're maintaining what makes sense, and that's worked really well for us. Let's go to the next slide here. So what I'd like to do before we show the... Um, this next video, let me tell you a little bit about Judge Newman. She's in a place called Henderson County. Um, and Henderson County is sort of a crossroads for us. So uh, she's by a, a city in Kentucky called Owensboro. And then there's another city in Indiana, it's called Evansville. And she's right in the middle and she just gets a lot of traffic. And so although she's sort of out in the country, to be honest, you know, much of Kentucky is rural, uh, she gets just a whole lot of people passing through for one reason or another. And therefore her docket is very diverse. And so we've set up an international docket, a monthly international docket, we call it, um, to serve the needs of these LEPs. And we've done that remotely. And she's been one of our, uh, our great partners because of the flexibility she's shown us. So let's fast forward to the end, now that we've put this in place and now that she's used it, and let's get her opinion on this, on what it's been like. And we had a, a Spanish interpreter, Miss Vanessa, who would rush to Henderson. She had a broad territory. And I know it wasn't unusual for her to have to drive uh, 100 miles or so from one court to the other to get here and then have to leave here to go to another court. And we would handle those cases uh, in the midst of a mainly English speaking docket. With remote technology, we've been able to much more easily, in my opinion, I don't know, interpreting is a, a skill and a talent that I have learned to appreciate greatly. Uh, and we have been able to see many interpreters remotely and our Spanish interpreters don't have to travel. Nobody has to travel because all of our interpreters can be present remotely. There's many languages that we see in our court system and it's particularly better in my opinion for the interpreter who can appear via Zoom 
Our technology is set up in the courtroom so that I can turn this uh, screen, uh, this Dell all-in-one around so that the interpreter can uh, face the defendant and the defendant can see that person interpreting for them. And we, they're right here. It's, um, it's amazing technology. I don't know what we did before it and I don't know what we would do without it. So it, it took us a while to get to this point, obviously. Um, we've had uh, what I might call our Kentucky Remote Simultaneous Interpreting Derby, right? Um, there have been a lot of, uh, just a, a lot of bruises and bumps along the way. I'm sure many of you have experienced some of that as well. L let me tell you a little bit about the, the journey and then I wanna tell you a little more about the technology. So um, currently we are working to uh, invest and upgrade our technological infrastructure in all of our courtrooms, so 400 plus courtrooms. And it's a, it's a moving target as Beth was describing. You know, by the time we get one done, there's something else that has just come out. As long as we are on that list of evolution that Beth, uh, that Beth described before, as long as we're at point number two, we can make the solution that I'm gonna share with you work really well. The biggest challenge for us have been hybrid proceedings. Beth sort of mentioned this just a little bit. So hybrid proceedings means, you know, you got some people in the courtroom and you got some people connected from out of the courtroom and then the interpreter's obviously not in the courtroom and so they're in different places. The problem with that is the audio um, from an interpreting perspective, I, it's just a universal truth. I cannot interpret what I cannot hear. I can be the best interpreter in the world. If I can't hear it, you're not gonna get a precise interpretation, right? Likewise, if they can't hear me in the courtroom, when I go into English, it's not gonna work well. So how do you get a sustainable audio experience when you're dealing with hybrid proceedings? Because a lot of times you just, you can't control what that remote user has, what the device, do they have the right headset? Are they connected correctly? Those things are really, really a challenge. So that's been really um, one of the biggest obstacles for us to overcome. We resolved that on some level by using what I'll call mobile interpreting kits. Um, and these are really neat. I'm gonna show you a picture of them in just a moment. So. Uh, what happened initially was we received some grant funding to purchase nine of these kits and were able to meet people where they are, quite literally, by providing one of these kits. Um, it has everything that you need, integration, in order to tap into the, the courtroom's um, audio system and provide really an excellent experience. It's worked really well for us. Uh, if there's a biggest lesson learned that I would mention, and this is, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but I would say that training is so important. Uh, continual training, uh, never ending training, training on all levels. So I can talk about training interpreters. We can have the best audio system set up. And if my interpreter doesn't know how to use the simultaneous functionality, doesn't work well. We've been there a few times. Um, have to have court personnel trained. If nobody's in the courtroom to take care of the equipment, to set it up, to turn it on, to troubleshoot, that's an issue. Judges have to be trained as well, right? They have to understand what's going on. They have to be able to do some troubleshooting. We have turnover at times, both in the interpreting world and court personnel. It's continual training. You can have the best plan in place, but if your people don't know what they're doing, it doesn't work. So we've worked a lot on this type of training. Let's go to the next slide. Let me show you what um, one of our mobile kits look like. This is sort of a generic picture and I'll show you a real one in a moment. So there's nothing extraordinary necessarily about the mobile kit we put together. We did some research. We came up with, uh, with the specs of, of what was needed. So essentially what we have in each kit, you get a, um, a couple of laptops and the laptops have been imaged specifically to sort of do just one thing. You know, this, this Zoom interpreting, that's the main platform we use. That, that's really all that they do. Uh, we have a couple of really uh, high level headsets. Let me give you guys some advice as well. If, if you're thinking about going this direction and thinking about implementing something like this on a court wide level, you say, well, what's important? What's important for the interpreters? What's important for, for success? One thing, believe it or not, is get, a, get, a, get some good headsets, um, get some wired headsets. Everybody is really enamored by, you know, USB chip headsets, Bluetooth headsets, and they have their function. I use one sometimes for some things. But if I want a good audio quality, I want a stable quality, something that's low maintenance, I'm gonna get something that's wired directly, right, directly to my device. So that would be my, um, my advice. Also, we have a couple of these omnidirectional speakers. They're actually Bluetooth speakers, but we typically hardwire them. They'll, they'll be plugged directly in. Uh, we don't have to use these often. I'll explain a little bit more about how that works in a moment, but they give us some additional audio capacity if needed. Let's go to the next slide real quick. So um, this is one of our actual mobile kits. And I sort of say mobile, it's only mobile if you know you're, you're huge like I am, obviously, right? So, you know, you pick them up and you know, you move them. It's, it's quite a heavy kit. It's got a big, big box there. Um, but this is how it looks. You know, you can set one of these laptops, laptops up um, at an individual table. So you could have two LEPs at the same time. They would each have their own headset. 
if we have integration in a courtroom, so we're at least at step two of the slide we talked about before, laptop interface. Uh, you don't need the, uh, the speakers at all that are there. What happens is that we receive that audio feed from all the external mics, right? Um, the interpreter who's offsite can get that directly, you know, fed to them to wherever they are. Um, and then when we need to go into English, we just toggle back over and it's heard over the loudspeaker. Again, the, the, the quality is pretty exceptional, I'll say. From an interpreting perspective, it makes it easier. You can turn up the volume, right? You can hear. It's always an issue to hear over yourself when you're speaking, when you're interpreting, right? With this, we sort of take that out of the equation. It, it's a really a, a great system. Uh, let me give you guys a little bit of feedback, share some feedback from a couple of our judges. Uh, you've seen uh, a couple of them already. They are frequent users of the, um, the services we provide. Let's hear from them. Simultaneous interpreting has improved 100 fold since the beginning of our digital platforms. Initially, we would do it on the Zoom platform, but you couldn't always hear everything and it would take a lot longer because everything had to be interpreted and we would have to stop and allow the interpretation and then ask another question. The simultaneous interpretation allows everybody to hear everything at the same time. And so not only is it more efficient, but I believe it's a better delivery model for the individual who needs the interpretive uh, language being used. They're able to hear and, and hear, hear the responses and understand all of that at the same time versus having to wait for the slowdown. And I would say our cases on our interpreter cases, they probably used to take twice as long as uh, a case that did not have an interpreter. Now they're, they're equal in time. So we're able to do exactly the, provide the same level of access and quality. Simultaneous uh, interpreting services has the potential because again, we're still on the, the fledgling side of this. And so we're still working with our main interpreter and for our Spanish interpreter uh, on how to fully use or utilize that system. But it has the potential ability to expedite some hearings that are longer in nature, especially remotely, uh, greatly. In fact, it would. we had one recently with a preliminary hearing that Judge Sizemore did that we did not have that technology available to us. It, that hearing took almost four hours. It, we went through three interpreters in that four hour period. If we had had that technology, it would have eliminated having the pause and it would have probably shortened it to about 45 minutes. So again, that the potential for that simultaneous interpretation is exponential. So it, it would allow us also the freedom to speak without having to pause. And it would also get the interpreter out of our, uh, I guess, out of our courtroom or Zoom room as it may be, and into other rooms throughout the Commonwealth to allow them to continue those services and sort of open up the arena for their services to other counties. The greatest benefit that I've experienced using simultaneous interpreting is that the parties are able to hear the same information at the same time, as if it's generally in a conversation, instead of perhaps losing a bit of it while you're waiting to hear uh, what the other person has to say, and then we don't have attorneys and the judge uh, kind of talking over top of each other because everybody's trying, you're trying to keep that flow going where you're addressing objections and also providing information or responding. And the simultaneous interpreter services allows that to occur with the minimal amount of uh, disruption. Ladies and gentlemen, before I sign off, let me just put one plug in. Um, so we would love to work with you on a, some type of national level collaboration. If this is something you're interested in, you're not sure where to start. If it's something that you would like to, to pursue or find out a little bit more on, please contact us. You know, I think there's a lot of traction here. Um, from state to state, we see that the usage of remote technology for language access varies. Uh, but I think that remote services are here to stay, as we talked about earlier. The, there's just no way around it. The benefits are great um, if you can overcome the obstacles at the beginning. We'd love to work with you. So I just put that out there as an open invitation. Please don't hesitate to contact us if we may be of assistance and uh, maybe we can do some brainstorming. With that, let me turn it over to Beth to start our panel discussion. Thanks, Josh. So I think this slide kind of summarizes what we're thinking about in terms of future considerations. We've already talked about the fact that the technology is going to change. So are you ready? 
are you ready? Do you have your programs and your systems in place to sustain technology changes now and well into the future? Again, I think one of the things that, that we rely heavily on are our people, right? And so to establish systematic programs is really, really important. And, and just like Josh said, if any of you are interested in a judicial support specialist program, how we got started, what it looks like, how you can leverage something similar, including our remote court proceedings, support personnel, our facilitators, happy to have that dialogue with you. Um, ensuring access to justice. There are still disparities, right? People have digital literacy um, challenges. People may be in remote locations, not have access to internet. How do we bridge those differences and how do we reach those people where they are? Um, I think one of the challenges that we've heard about from some of our attorneys and our judges alike is I can't really equate the communication and the interaction if they're not here with me. So how do we, how do we bridge that gap moving into the future and what does that look like? And then I think evolving your programs. Sort of start somewhere. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing kind of thing. And it's not a one size fits all. So start somewhere and then be willing to continuously improve that program over time. I think judges and clerks and, and people just generally are more apt to pull technology when they see the advantage of it versus us pushing it. So how do we develop that kind of change culture such that we're encouraging that kind of adoption? So I think all those are kind of um, future considerations, and I'll turn it over to my esteemed panelists for additional comments. Uh, the one thing I would like to bring up is uh, all of these technologies, all of these systems working together, uh, it requires training. And it was brought up by both of the panelists previously uh, how important that was. There's a recertification process that goes with this JSS. It's not just doing it one time and being done with it. You've got to continuously improve technology is changing uh, you have people and there's turnover cases that we were talking about so having that program in place making sure that the, the operators the users of the system are given the ability to thrive in these environments is what I think is probably the most important thing out of all of this yes you're providing service to these folks uh, yes you're providing the, the, the operators the ability to make things move efficiently but without those training programs in place and in the, the kind of revisiting of those programs it's going to stall out and i run into that on the on the business side of it a lot of times all the money will go into the technology but the training does not get taken into consideration especially if you're going to have turnover in these environments so it's one of the key things here that i would take away from this i'd like to open up the the floor for questions any questions that we can answer for you or um, anything the panelists might be able to uh, to respond to I actually have an online question that came in, I was talking about the uh, JSS program, if you could maybe explain that a little bit more and you know, what's the benefit to the people, not, not just the judge, but also to the, uh, the people, the JSSs themselves. Okay, very good. So remember when we talked about I am not a cat, had they had a facilitator or a JSS welcoming those individuals to remote court, that person, the attorney, would have gotten that all figured out before they went into the courtroom. So the advantage is to have that welcoming introduction to the participants, whether they are the remote participants, um, having them have that comfort level as they enter into the courtroom. The facilitator sets the expectation about what's going to happen. You may have to room into may have to move into a room to talk to your attorney. This is how that works. So that person is kind of your filter or the filter for remote court. And I think that that's where we've seen the greatest success and also where we have witnessed improvement in decorum in the courtroom. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that program, I'm happy to have that conversation as well. And I will bring the microphone to you. Yes, the one in the back of the room. I'm not very quick, give me a sec. I hope you're gonna say who you are. Hi, my name is Laurie Givens, and I used to work for Beth Lucas when I was the administrative director in Kentucky. Um, and it, uh, it's a great team up there, and thank you guys for doing the presentation. I heard the latter part of the question. I apologize, I missed the first part. We created a salary incentive to get this certification. I don't know if you guys talked about that. I heard that in the last part of the question. What's the benefit to the JSS? Other than a different job description, but they also are paid at a higher level once they complete the certification. We do monitor 
uh, sort of their progress so it's not just an empty certification and they're actually kind of doing the work. And we created a group of, of users also so they have each other to rely on across the state just for that, that mentoring sort of support also. So I don't know, Beth, if you wanted to add anything about that. I, th I think it's a great benefit to the JSSs in terms of an expanded skill set. Yeah, and I think that the judges have really appreciated the opportunity to have their staff engaged in that way as well. So Lori alluded to the fact that we have um, self-reporting that's done by the, the facilitators or by the JSSs. They report every month as to the number of uh, sessions that they facilitated. But we also have electronic tools that tell us how often the judge submitted an e-order, um, and how often the judge responded to um, a, a attorney filing electronically. So those things we have automatically, but having the JSS self-report and then also having the JSS newsletter where they can share ideas, share successes, share challenges, and leverage those as they move forward as a facilitator in their own jurisdictions. And one thing to add, I know we did include in the online materials, this is a paperless conference, but there is the uh, two-sided piece that kind of explains how the courtroom set up, but on the back it explains the JSS program and some of the details around that. So if you are here and you're interested in seeing more of the details, there is a flyer out there that you can get to using the, the online application and, and get that. One of the things we also did was develop an internal SharePoint site um, for our judges and our JSSs to visit that has all of our materials, how to start facilitating day one, um, we have some uh, how to participate uh, at, with language access information. So all of that information is stored centrally in a SharePoint site and is accessible to those folks who need it. And would that be something you would be willing to share with anyone in this room if they were starting up their own program? Sure. That's the answer I was looking for. Any other questions? Yes, sir. My name's Jerry. I just have about funding. Is there a, a problem with all this technology and cost? And well, that is, is that a rhetorical question? Or um, I, I think we've been very fortunate in Kentucky that we've had uh, funding provided by our legislative uh, branch for several of our technology projects. Um, we've also had other grant opportunities that we've secured. Um, like I said earlier, our Supreme Court and our Chief Justice, as well as our former director, have been very instrumental in securing additional funding for us. Um, but there's ongoing costs, right? It's not just that initial, let's get everything bought. You have maintenance and support. So understand that there's long-term costs associated with, as you grow, you know, your technology solutions, I think is important as well. I think Boring has a comment there. Good morning, Wilfredo, uh, Washington, D.C. So um, thanks, thank you very much for the presentation. And my question was on the access to justice. Have you found that there is a, with re, in relation to Kentucky, that you have a digital divide? Um, have you had feedback from just the population in general about broadband, access to a computer? If so, how have you, or what are the plans to uh, bridge that digital divide? Um, like remote site locations, has that been a challenge and how do you plan to address it if it needs addressing? Right, and, and have, it, have it, any of you been to Kentucky? Have you, any, have you been to rural Kentucky? So we have broadband challenges, definitely, and I think that that's one of the things that we have to look at in each location is increasing the broadband for each location in 120 counties. So we have done that in every single county. That was kind of one of our first infrastructure um, challenges was let's make sure we're at the highest speed possible because video takes more than anything else, right? So you have to be prepared with that. As far as digital learning is concerned or digital literacy, I think that's a challenge for us all. And how do we approach that, you know, not just day one, but on an ongoing basis? Um, we have worked really hard with another project, our self-represented litigant portal, and we have online forums, online interviews that also help reach those people where they are. So I think it's it's a it's not a one size fits all. There have to be a lot of different avenues to help close that divide, but also our JSSs and our facilitators help to do that as well. Any other? I just wanted to mention that the General Assembly didn't just open their pocket 
books for us. Um, and I know you guys know how hard that is, whether you're looking at your, your state leaders or your county officials for funding. But we went after a lot of those federal ARPA dollars very aggressively when the COVID money came out. So I don't know if you got, that's where so, so much of our funding and our one-time funding came from. You know, there are still pockets of money out there in different places. There's still money out there nationally for access to justice initiatives. So, you know, kind of looking at some things, putting some creative grants together, we're happy to talk to you guys about any of that also and just strategize about, you know, looking for different funding opportunities that might be in addition to just going to ask your, your funders for an appropriation, so. And coming up front. Hi, my name is Jawad. I'm the manager of jury programs for the state of New Jersey. And I wanted to know how did you apply technology, if you did at all, to uh, your jurors and uh, in the state? Thank you for that question. Um, our Most of our technology geared toward our jury management has been with text notification and working with a text notification vendor provider for that service, um, which we've now, I think we're up to maybe more than half of our counties are participating in that. That's really been our focus today. Did you have a comment? I do look like you're gonna, okay. That's really been our focus. And I, I do want to say, we, I've been told, we have a hard stop at quarter till. We're close to that. But if anybody has other questions, oh, he says we have one minute. So we, no? Oh, oh we have until 12 now. Okay. Well, then we'll take more questions if there are more questions. I'm interested to know, did you have a learning curve with your judiciary when you started implementing your remote services? And how did you, how did you handle that? That's a great question. Um, I think there are always differences between where people are, right? You talk about meeting people where they are. That includes your elected officials, right? So some of our elected officials took off like an airplane. Um, and, and it was kind of hard to, we, to bring them back in, right? I'm grateful that they did that. And, and those are our leading change agents, right? And so having them help others kind of help themselves was 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 big. Um, with respect to those who maybe have other, you know, aren't maybe as technology savvy, but were open to change, then we went to that group, right? And then, and then lastly, you have those who really don't care for it much, but didn't really have a choice. So kind of just working through our, we have a judicial education committee for each level of court, working with those judicial uh, education chairs to, to talk to them about technology and how things are changing. And that's just an evolution, right? That's just something we have to do all the time. And how do you figure out how to reach them in a way that is meaningful to them? Like what's in it for me, right? So, so that's a lot of what we're, we're doing and still doing. This is, this is more a comment than a question, and in reference to the question earlier about bringing uh, the technology to areas that maybe are, are short with broadband coverage and, and things of that nature. So ARPA and that whole process of securing funds to expand internet availability is, has been a challenge, but one of the things that we've done in some communities I've worked with was uh, identify you know, like libraries and other public resources as places where, where people could go to get coverage if they needed to. And then the other thing we did was actually create a space in the courthouse that if people did show up, that we would not turn them away or tell them to go out to the parking lot to conduct their hearing. Because sometimes the judicial officer may not have been in that particular courthouse. So we allowed them to use an attorney conference room or something of that nature that has the appropriate equipment to, so they can conduct their hearing without delay. That's a great comment. Um, we actually have a legal help center in uh, one of our larger jurisdictions, Fayette County in Lexington, and that has been a pilot program that we actually launched as part of this ongoing initiative to reach people where they are. Um, there is a public workstation where they can come in and fill out those forms, do those guided interviews. So we're looking at, now how do you get that statewide? How do you take a program in one of your largest counties and launch it statewide? So that's one of the things we're looking at in the future as well. Any additional questions going on? Okay. And we're happy to stay, so everybody can leave and we'll stay if you want to ask more questions. That's right. I'll get up to the next slide. We do have some email addresses to share.
So guys, I think uh, you've done a great job representing what the state of Kentucky is doing, everything else. One of the questions I saw that came in uh, remotely was just about the language interpretation. How long did that actually take to get implemented? And uh, you know, is it, are you done with the whole process or are you still on a learning curve with it? Yeah, it's very much a, a work in progress. How long did it take? Well, overnight, uh, pandemic unfortunately, right? Uh, how long does it take to get right and to implement? No, it's certainly ongoing. So with the mobile kits that we have, we can set that up anywhere, essentially across the state. We have enough flexibility with that to either integrate with what the courtroom has or to sort of do our, our own thing with our speakers, right? So we can do that. Uh, I'll also mention just as a side note, we talked about setting up other spaces for people to participate, you know, other courtroom spaces. That's the great thing about the mobile unit idea. You wouldn't have to be in a courtroom. You could be in a conference room, you could be in some other designated space. We could provide the equipment and they can, we can meet them where they are, right? But back to the, the uh, original question, how, how long are you done? You know, is, it, it, is, it, is it ongoing or what? Yeah, I, I foresee it being ongoing for a long time, right? The technology itself, the training piece. Somebody asked about training um, the judiciary, training the bench. Uh, that never changes. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we had, I don't know how many dozens of new judges that came in through an election cycle starts over every time. Uh, the courtrooms themselves are constantly being updated. Our interpreters have to be flexible. The, the technology itself changes and therefore our approach has to change. And so it, it's never ending. The key to this, I'll go back to what I said before, it, it's training. It's training for all sides. Um, as Brian said, it's, it's not a one-time training and you're done. It's constantly revisiting, constantly identifying leaders out in the field, leaders in the interpreting profession, leaders in uh, court personnel who can assist you with that implementation. That never stops. It's a huge effort. So ongoing for the foreseeable future, I would say. And one of the things just, I know there's a mention about cost that came up and how do you fund this. I think uh, NACOM or NCSC actually did a study about the cost of going to, if you have a stenographer base right now and you're using stenographers in your court still, that about the, you know, how the return on your investment, if you go to a recording or use that stenographer as a central base and then you do the recordings of the courts, that, that it kind of will pay for itself over time. So yes, there's additional funding out there, but there's also, once, once you get electronic uh, communications established in your courts, you can use it for all these different programs to establish uh, access for you know the underserved communities out there. So that's great. Are there any other questions? And if not, I would like to thank Beth, Joshua, and Brian for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.